everybody. Welcome to episode seven. It's August 6, 2016. Uh, my name is Mitch, and of course we've got Gab in the studio. Gab, how's it going? Hey, everyone. And Yilma, how are you doing? Hey, good morning. And uh, today we're actually uh, on site again at Drift Outfitters, just down on Queen East in Toronto. And uh, well, this time we're not interviewing Rob. We're interviewing Chris, who is, uh, who is someone else that works here at Drift. And uh, we're going to be talking to him today about fly tying. And actually, more specifically, fly design, which is uh, something we teased at yesterday in a post on social. Um, but to kick it off, Chris, how you doing? I'm good, and you? I'm doing pretty well. How's the shop doing today? It's, uh, it hasn't opened yet. It's only, what, 9 o'clock? You guys open at 10, eh? Something like that, yeah. It's a little quiet so far. Yeah. Or uh, VIP. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's not bad. We're just surrounded by fly tying material, and Yilma's looking at all the reels he can buy. <laughs> yep. <laughs> And all the nets. I think you might need a net, right? Yeah, I have yeah. some new waders. Some new waders. Yeah. Yeah. How big a net? Something for big fish or uh, little guys? Small fish. Small fish. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. If you know me at all. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so the shop, how are you guys doing? Like, it's been pretty busy this summer, eh, for you? Yeah, it's been awesome around here. Not a lot of fishing getting in, but um, lots of exciting stuff. A couple new brands picked up. Uh, we're now an Able dealer. We've got uh, Raven stuff, the uh, center pin uh, steelhead season. Got a uh, big restock of Patagonia. Lots of exciting stuff coming in. Nice. So you guys, okay, so you're selling Able Reels and stuff now too? We are. Yep. Ooh, those are sweet. Those are like, are. I, I like the ones with the um, fish. I know I'm talking about aesthetic right now. Oh, no, no. Right? no, no the eyes are glazed. There's a reason no, that they're made. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Great it's the ones with the fish skins on yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, Oh, those are so those are cool. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, like the closed kind of. Ooh, I love them. Yeah, we had a couple in. As uh, gentleman I ordered one of the steelhead ones and the, the tribal raven ones. A big kind of... Um, um, sort of aboriginal print on it. Yeah. It's really, really cool. Yeah, yeah. those are sweet, man. Uh, that might be my next purchase, I think, would be like a like yeah. a nice five, six weight, mm. you know, like fish skin kind of able. Oh, I love this. Yeah. Oh. Uh, pretty sweet. Yeah, man. But anyway, so, um, you, so you, ha- you said you haven't been fishing a whole lot this summer, but I'd like to know what that means. Because, yeah, uh, still getting out probably twice a week if possible, Yeah, which is low by our standards, but... Um, yeah, it's something at least. Mm-hmm. Um, haven't been doing much trout since, I'd say, June. It's been wickedly hot around here, so oh, we've kind of left that behind. It's all warm water now. Yeah. Um, it's been a pretty good season, pretty yeah. solid for bass. And uh, when we did get a chance to fish trout, we cleaned up. It was oh, a yeah. great season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing. Like, we fished, uh, we were fishing early in the in the season, too, for trout. Yeah. Um, not, you know, I mean, I don't think the weather affected our lack of success much, but it's been so hot. Mm-hmm. Like it's not a bit like there's no way we're catching trout with 40 degree weather, but no. we can't catch them in cold water. No, you know? no. <laughs> but so we've been fishing bass and stuff too. But uh, you've been fishing uh, warm water. You said was that just bass or what are you? Yeah, bass, muskie, pike, Ooh, carp, anything. Yeah, that's really. the oh, golden word. Yeah, reverse, <laughs> reverse. Word. Yeah. Which one, muskie? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I've. I'll be honest. I haven't been out too much for them. A couple trips here and there. Um, just one fall so far as summer for me. Hmm. Uh, I'll be heading out on Monday, actually. We're doing a drift at Okay. Um, that's going to be fun. I'll be a pretty much day kid musky trip, so we'll see how yeah. we do there. We'll yeah, do yeah. report then. Have you got any muskies so far this year? Not this year. Because no. they're fish of a thousand casts, I've heard, right? Pretty well. Yeah, yeah. It's like watching paint dry. Yep, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Pike's been all right. That's yeah? Nice filler, at least. Oh, that's great. Pike yeah. is, yeah. We haven't got, I haven't oh. touched a pike in a long time, since Ottawa. Yeah, mm-hmm. me too. It's yeah. Crazy. yeah. I haven't kind of the bike since Ottawa as well. And yeah. I moved there three years ago. <laughs> moved out of there two yeah. years ago. So Ottawa's all pike. It's all pike and bass. Yep. Oh, like you've got some so great warm water out there. Yeah. I've only fished that area a handful of times, yeah. but it is one of my favorite areas for bass. Oh, my God, yeah. Pike, I haven't touched too much out there, but the bass fishing is just out of this world. Yeah, the yeah. Ottawa River. It's, got, it's a good flat as well. Yeah. It's got some good... Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's like tons of smallmouth rocks and stuff too, like... Uh, this one, Mississippi, actually, is just yep. – it's so nice, man. I fish that river a lot because uh, I used to live right by there and, like, tons of smallies and just pike, like, crazy amount of pike. A lot of small ones, though. Yeah. You know? Does the Saugeen have, uh, like, nice pike fishing, too? Because I know it's good it's smallies. Got, yeah, it's got pike in it as well. It's got great smallie fishing. It's got largemouth. It's got carp at the lower ends. It's uh, – one of the largest steelhead runs around here. Um, just yeah. tens of thousands of fish in yeah, that yeah. river. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Steelhead um, season's coming up too, eh? It's close. It's really yeah. a salmon, you'll see them very, very soon. Really, eh? Yeah, you might see a couple early ones trickle in right now, but yeah. uh, basically oh, like first, first downpour that. that we get in August, yeah. you'll see them. I'm 
completely off salmon now, apart yeah. from off piers. But if you're interested, yeah. it'll be here soon. But it's a nice precursor to steelhead season. It is. Some of those salmon start coming in. It's like, oh, yeah, fall yeah. is just around the corner. They get some early steelhead yeah, as well. I big. follow them up. Like, they aren't even running, right? They're yeah. they're following the steel or the salmon, I should say, and they're feeding off their eggs, basically. Oh, and yeah. so occasionally, if you watch closely enough, you'll see these little silver fish following salmon up. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. Browns as well. Wow, oh, go. early. Yep. Um, or at least I've seen them is late August. Yeah. Well, that's wow. exactly because last year when we fished, we went out uh, early because yeah, we were right. just really excited, and, mm-hmm. and I hooked into a steelhead at the end of August. Sure. Remember that? Yeah. 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 And it boiled, mm-hmm. and then it was, and then it left. But that was, uh, I was like, oh my god, it was like just late August. It was like yeah. still summer. Mm-hmm. It was hot. It was like oh that. yeah. But, last uh, summer, I thought I think I caught my first salmon. It was mid August. Yeah, like if you get 20, a, a first heavy rain, if you get cool nights yeah. as well, mm-hmm. all those little things, and depending on the winds as well in Lake Ontario, all those little things contribute to how early I start. But you'll see them off piers now. They'll come in tight. Yeah, um, That's early uh, morning hours, late at night. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then throughout the day, you'll start to see them creeping in uh, closer to September. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm pretty stoked. Mm-hmm. Have you guys been prepping for the fall push? Yeah, getting yeah. supplies in for that. Um, we've got our serpent stuff stocked up. We've got lots of space stuff. Nice. Um, yeah, we're pretty well stocked for that stuff. So yeah, lots was, of spay heads, all that kind of stuff. Everybody's getting ready. I guess they're going to be getting ready to go. So if oh, yeah. they need stuff, come in because you guys are ready to. Oh, yeah, definitely. Right on. Yeah, and we're go. ready to rock. Yeah, perfect. Well, today we're going to be, uh, so like I said, we're going to talk about fly tying. So fly tying is something that we, like we all, the three of us all, all, Tie flies, right? Yelma, do you tie yet? I don't tie yet. Mm, okay, I'm um, not. Mitch, when we first met, he gave me my first um, yeah. kit, but I haven't started. Yeah. But yeah. me, Gab, you, you tie. And we've yeah, seen some videos. I've been tying for, for a bit. Yeah. Um, I love it. I haven't tied this summer a lot mm-hmm. for that video the other day, but that's about it. Yeah. No, same with me. I haven't tied in, in a long time. Just, I don't know. I just kind of haven't. It's more like when I'm getting ready to go fishing, I just kind of pop in here, grab a couple of flies, and yeah. just go and hope I don't lose them. But I've also got like crazy stockpiles of just hundreds of flies I've never fished. That, you know, that's my here. problem. That's why I don't tie right now. I just have a ton of flies, but I'm not catching that much fish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. you, uh, you Chris, you tie uh, some beautiful flies, and uh, I've seen a bunch of them on, on uh, online, and Gab showed me tons of pictures. Um, but what we're going to talk about today is fly design, right? Yep. So what's 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 the difference between fly tying and fly design? All right. So they kind of go hand in hand. Fly tying is what everyone does. So you can sit down at a table, look in a book, pick out a pattern, say, okay, I'm going to tie that pattern. You can tie. You can tie a great fly. But it doesn't necessarily do you all that much good if you don't know why it's being tied that way, why it's going to work. Fly design is the reason that most of us should be tying. Because if you're just tying blindly, you can go to any shop, buy the patterns cheaper than you can tie them. All right, You're not going to save money fly tying, usually. Um, fly design is the ability to look at your materials, determine what is going to serve what purpose, um, and incorporate into a fly that's going to do something different and knowing what it's going to do in the water. Basically studying the hydrodynamics of fly, how it's casting, how it's swimming, how it fishes. Um, that's basically it. Okay, so the difference then is really just in the fly design is more about the architecture of the fly. Exactly. And how it will kind of respond yep. in the water. That's it. And if you want to design your own flies, something new, then you kind of have to understand the fly design side of things before you can actually sit down and start tying. Right, 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 right. So, Chris, you're a young fellow. When did you get into, and how did you get into fly fishing? Because uh, you, your flies are kind of like uh, a million times better than anything I've ever tied. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been doing it for, like, what, 11 years, 12 years? And, uh, yeah, I've, yeah, I tried to do the salmon one, all that stuff, and I was just like, man. It's I don't dedication. Have... Yeah. So when did, when did you start? I started when I was seven or eight years old, I guess. Good lord! Pro- no, probably Jeez. eight years old. Yeah. Wait, Doogie Howser fly fishing. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I guess some of our target will know that reference, but I don't know. If you know. <laughs> He's looking at me. <laughs> yeah, so seven or eight years old. How did you get into something it? like that? So I've been fishing since I was, you know, this tall, yeah. nothing, and um, so I guess it's kind of natural pro- progression for me again to fly fishing itself. Uh, it was you know, kind of a challenge. Saw my first kid at a Canadian Tire, whatever it was, cheap little thirty dollar thing that broke on me after the first couple trips out. Mm. Um, but it was always kind of 
curious, and so I picked it up, and I got into it, started casting, and I started tying flies as well. Nice. Uh, I think I might have even started tying before I started fishing. Mm-hmm. Uh, not fishing, but fly fishing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, just around the house, take you know, hooks and um, sewing thread, feathers that I'd pull out of pillows, Yo. and just lash them onto hooks yeah. to see what happens. Um, and I got a kit eventually for my birthday, whatever it was, mm-hmm. and kind of went on from there. Nice. Man, so. that's funny you say that because that's a, literally the exact same way that I started tying flies. Yeah. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, yeah. and I used a uh, sewing thread, yep. and I took a jig, yep. like a three-quarter ounce jig, yeah. and I started tying like blue thread on this thing, and I, I, I bought a bucktail from a, from a baron or something okay. in Ottawa, and I, I think I might have tied, it was like, you know how they sometimes they'll cut them up, and then they dye individual, and they sell them in the packs of like nine kind sure, of chunks. Yeah, yeah. I just kind of like, I tied that right onto the hook, like just a big piece of friggin' bucktail. Tied and all, yeah. Yeah, and it was just like, look at this, this stupid thing. Like, oh, I'm going to catch so many fish. Not. And I still have that, but I've never used it to fish because yeah. it's... No, you can't. You yeah. frame that thing. <laughs> just, yeah, away. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy, man. So you started fly tying pretty young then, you said before you started fishing. Yep. Um, so did you ever, um, like, what kind of flies did you start tying like what kind of fish did you start fishing for and how did that influence what you were tying yeah. most of my fishing back then would have been warm water stuff so it was bass pike you know all the usual um accessible fish around here where about where about oh it's around here yeah gotcha yeah i've lived around here my whole life so okay. kind of waters pretty well um so it was mostly warm water stuff i kind of worked out of a book to start mm-hmm. i had um a fly tying bible just kind of everyone's Yo, yeah. first fly tying book i gotta give that to you because they're they're just cool to look through yeah, yeah. tons absolutely. of patterns they're sick they tell you the recipes everything right yeah, yeah. it's mostly a, a trope book for sure yeah but it is one of the books they start with everybody starts with yeah and um so i kind of worked through that start yeah. and i didn't do a ton of time through my first few years it was more of an on off kind of thing uh, i really got into it probably four or five years ago yeah since then tying a couple thousand flies a year yeah jesus yeah a couple thousand a year yep oh. around that man well you you tie commercially now as I do. well like yeah. you have your own website yep I've, you tie for the shop here yep i'm the custom tire for the shop as well yeah um yeah most of those flies i tie don't get to fish <laughs> oh man i didn't know that <laughs> yeah that's crazy so what's the so is it just the um there's some sort of love for just doing it versus just using it just to fish yeah there's definitely part of that um part of the reason thousands I a big number that. It's a big number. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thousands is an even bigger number. <laughs> yeah. It is very time-consuming, but um, I kind of do it for practice, mm-hmm. really, what it comes down to. When you're tying that many flies, you can really work on your consistency. You can um, get to experiment with new kinds of things, depending mm-hmm. on what people want. So it's a, a good opportunity to practice that. There's not much money in it, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, it's a lot of fun to yeah. just kind of sit down and work things out. Yeah. I think that's key, to tie the same patterns. Like it is. over and over like yep. um you see people like they're like oh i'm gonna go for trout and then they spend two hours they have like 10 different patterns but like if you spend like a good six hours tying the same flies over and over yeah. you'll, you'll see like your first fly looks like shit and then the last one looks really good absolutely yeah you just I, undo the it's first little... half and then you <laughs> tie them again you know? yeah. Like, yeah it's a little boring but that is the best way to, mm-hmm. to tie flies for beginners usually what i'll do if I'm going to sell them a kit to start, it would be basic tools, but then just the materials tie one color woolly bugger. And I tell them, all right, tie 25, that's a May Hook Center pack usually. Uh, woolly buggers, all exactly the same. When you're done, you can come back for more. Yeah, that's yeah. all you should be doing to start. Mm-hmm. Just work at consistency, make sure that things look the same over and over and over again. Yeah. Okay, well, that's interesting. That's one thing that we talked about is the getting into fly fishing in general. Yep. Um, and our advice was kind of just you just get a nice basic rod and go out there and start trying it out. But for fly tying, like what would be a like what's a good initial? If I came to the shop and I had no idea what, what I was tying, I mean like we're looking at like crazy amounts of material, right? Like <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, well, shit, I don't know. I mean, what what's the best way to to get into fly tying? Maybe what's the best pattern? What's you know? Yeah. So to start, usually I get guys starting on a larger scale, so something like a small streamer, like a woolly bugger, is very approachable and easy yeah. to tie. doesn't require a lot of materials, a lot of expensive materials. Mm-hmm. Um, for the tool side of things, basically what you need is a vise, scissors, bobbin, that's it, to start. Um, you can get into other tools like whip finisher, a lot of guys find handy, um, you know, bodkins, hair stackers, all that you can leave. Uh, until you really want to get into it. Or if you know you really want everything to start, you can go for it all. But 
Uh, you just need really three tools, a handful of materials to start. Uh, vices, you know, a, like a $50 gas starter vice will do you. Mm-hmm. It'll wear down after a couple of years, but it'll get started, no problem. Yeah. Uh, so you don't have to spend a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, again, can't really be to save money because the way it works is if I were to buy a pack of 25 hooks and just enough materials to tie 25 flies every time I bought materials, I would save money as long as I used it all up. Mm-hmm. But the way most guys work when they're fly tying is buy a little of this, a little of that, a mm-hmm. little of this. And when you want to tie one pattern, maybe you need 10, 20 different materials. Um, and so you buy them all, then you never have to use for them again. Yeah. And so that's when it gets really expensive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, That's when ugly flies start to appear. Yep, exactly. Like, Just oh, taking scraps material. and throwing at a hook. It. Yeah. <laughs> so um, really, the biggest advantage to fly tying is definitely the customization factor. It's being able to, if you want to match, um, you know, a certain insect or a forage, um, being able to exactly match the uh, thing found in your water, um, or just being able to create something brand new that no one's ever seen before. That's yeah. the real advantage behind it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because, because I guess one of the uh, things with fly tying, right, is being able to customize the fly to the specific body of water, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. it's huge. Yeah, so yeah. I guess the, I guess that would be, a, would be a great advantage. But there is other stuff to fly tying, too. Like, it's fun, to, like you said, just to tie flies. It is. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great that doesn't have to be work. It can always be fun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what kind of stuff, uh, so you said you started tying simple streamers and stuff like that. How did it progress? Like, what interested you along the way? Like, was it like, oh, man, I don't know, it was bit of, flies, you know? Yeah, like, it was a bit of a challenge. I always got to see other people's flies, you know, online and books, whatever. And so it was, it was, um, you know, it was a destination I was trying to get to, you know, a, yeah. a place I'd like to be in my time. And so I just kind of kept working at that. There was a break probably a year or so where I just gave it up. Yeah. Uh, didn't even do much fishing that year. And a while later, I slowly came back to it, and that was just all out. I don't know what really did it. Yeah. Just kind of fell in love. Yeah. Or a life crisis. Yeah, yeah. Years <laughs> earlier than most. Yeah. That's it. Back in the fly fishing. Yeah. No, that's cool, man. Um, yeah. So you got, like, you tie in, like, some really nice salmon flies. I've seen pictures and stuff like that. Um, are you big into tying, like, classic patterns? Yeah, that's one of the bigger things that I'll do. Um, and big like saltwater or musky streamers is the other yes. especially but um, yes. those are just ton of fun those are oh my god talk about material right yeah. it's a lot of material right it is yeah yeah and it's heavy to cast can be that comes back to the fly design thing is that an improperly tied musky fly is going to be a lot to cast on any rod it doesn't matter if you have 10 weight 14 weight it's gonna be heavy um, if you tie it properly, you generally make it a little bit lighter, a little bit um, easier to shed water. Mm. Um, just little things can make it a lot more castable, a lot more user-friendly. Okay, so musky tying for you is kind of a bit of a new thing, right? I've been at it for a little while, but it's newer, I okay. guess, than you know, trout stuff for yeah. sure. So what uh, what got you into musky fishing? Musky? Big fish. Yeah. They're mean. Oh, they're it's so active nice. fishing. Yeah, it's not, you know... It, it's present, presentation based to a point, but it really is just down and dirty, big rods, big flies. Yeah. Yeah. What's your go-to pattern for like a muskie? Go-to would probably be something pretty basic, actually, kind of uh, just a big flash fly. So um, just heaps of flash tie off the back with a bit of bucktail, kind of prop it up, nice. uh, kind of like a Nicholas Bauer sort of style. Yeah. That's... That's yeah, cool. really easy one to tie, actually, and uh, gives a great profile, really easy casting. Yeah, 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 right on. So what I wanted to ask is, um, like, when you design your own fly, like, what's the what's the key to designing, like, a successful fly? So it depends on what you're doing. Uh, if you're going for trout, the key might be getting it down into the zone that you need it to be. It okay. may be realistically imitating um, you know, a certain fly or whatever. Um, if you're getting into pike and musky, usually it's profile, movement, castability. Um, so it kind of depends on what you're looking at. Okay. Um, but to go over trout flies first, since most guys be looking at that, probably. Uh, if you're tying nymphs, which is one of the more finicky aspects of it, um, we do a lot of urinymphing. And so uh, what that means is generally getting our fly down as quickly and easily yeah. as possible. Because you're fishing pocket water. And exactly. Stuff, right? Yeah, it's mostly what we do. So I'm looking at tying something, usually with tungsten beads. Tungsten's going to be heavier in brass, just a little thing uh, that you can take into consideration. Usually it'll be a fairly natural pattern with a hot spot. So yeah. if 
I'm looking at that fly, it's going to be a factor of the weight that's going to get down. You have a hot spot and usually a bead, a bead could be a hot spot, okay. to draw the fish into it, get their attention from a distance, okay. and then sort of natural profile to get them to commit. So the, uh, the hot spot then is just like a like an attractor of some kind. Exactly. Like yes. Yeah. Something flashy. Something shiny. Yeah. So that's my kind of approach with most nymphs. They're realistic nymphs. They'll tie as well and things like that. But that's generally what I go for. And it depends on what you want. If you want an attractor nymph, that's great. If you want something supernatural, it's terrible advice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but really what you have to do is you have to think of what you want to accomplish with the fly. Right? Yeah. So it depends on where you're fishing as well. Mm-hmm. If I'm going to fish really... A slow moving tail water or something like that with finicky fish. I'm not going to tie anything like that. I'm probably going to tie something much lighter weight, more natural, smaller. You're not going to go purple. Probably not. It could work. <laughs> you never know. You have to try it. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah you got to play around. Yeah. Uh, so it's really not much in terms of motion they have to worry about then. It's mainly um, the hydrodynamic side of things. So how is it going to get to where you want it and how is it going to just look with color and profile right. to the fish? Have you ever seen, uh, I watched this years ago, I watched this, because uh, I used to work at a fly shop in Ottawa. Yeah. Um, probably when I was around your age. And this guy would come in all the time, and he was like, oh, check out this DVD. He gave me this DVD of Czech nymphing. Mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, I th- I'm pretty sure that's what the flies were. And they yep. were like the ones where you weave Thre- uh, it's like it's okay. like not even thread. It's like it, floss. It's usually yarn or floss, yeah. something like that. And it yeah. was like these intricate like braided yep. bodies of these flies. Yep. Dude. They're so awesome. So cool. Yeah. Do you, you ever th- do like that? Do you ever tie those? I've done a handful. Yeah. yeah I can't say it's my favorite pattern, mm-hmm. but it's a productive one. It gives a killer look, especially for big stones and things like that. Yeah. It's a great look. Yeah. No, they're really cool. I'll, I'll, I'll show you guys later. Yeah. Super yeah. durable as well. Uh, no. No, they aren't usually mass produced. Not that I've seen. Mm-hmm. They're so um, meticulous. Yeah, that's yeah. something that they're like, very crazy. time consuming. Yeah. Basically what you do is you kind of turn your vice toward yourself you tie an overhand knot in the two materials they don't so a, a light and a dark color yeah and you'll kind of thread one of the twists of the overhand knot over the hook eye and tighten it down that's one rib and it'll give you a top and a bottom effect um and you just keep doing those all the way up the body until you Jesus. get to the, the, the front and um yeah that's your that's your whole body so it's really durable there's no exposed thread or anything yeah. like that for a fish to chew up really uh, but they are time consuming. They're su- but they're super cool. Like, How big are these flies? They can tie anywhere from a really tiny sixteen. Oh, really? So okay, okay. Sixteen on uh, a woven body would be, be a little fat, but uh, you know what to say uh, as big as you want, really size okay. yeah. six stone or whatever like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But, like it seems that it would be more suited for a bigger fly since it's all like that. Mid ways. to large size trout flies for okay. sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We should mm-hmm. try that. They're it's they're fun. really cool, man. They're like this one DVD was like it was like any of those old fly fishing DVDs, you know, mm-hmm. like this guy with his hat. <laughs> Ooh, I'm truck nymphing today with my forty foot rod. Like, yep. And uh, <laughs> it's easy. Just go in the pocket water, you know, you idiot. And he's like catching fish and shit. And then they're tying these flies, and they're just so cool looking. And it was like, wow. I tied a few, and then I was like, yeah, I'm not doing any more. No, of these. Like, this is way too much work. No, not at all. Yeah, yeah. Truck nymphing is an awesome technique. Mm-hmm. That's what we live and die by when it comes to trout fishing a lot of time. Yeah. Um, it outfishes anything else pretty much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's something I want to get more into it since I moved to Ontario. Since these uh, these browns are more finicky, I've always uh, I'm always been a dry or streamer kind of uh, trout fisherman. Yep. And uh, now I'm like seeing like when I went with Rob like uh, three weeks ago, and he's like chick nymphing, and he caught that beautiful brown. Yeah. And I'm like, man, I need to get into that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's extremely productive. Yeah. Especially it's a lot like more. A- at this time of year, right? Any time of year. Any time of year is good. Time of year, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. This time of year, like I said, I don't really do any trout fishing. Oh, right. Around yeah. here, at least. Yeah. But, um, yeah, fish feed most of the time under the water. They don't mm. come up a whole lot of time. It's fun when they do. Yeah. And you can get some great fish. But most of the time, they're feeding underneath. Yeah. And so it's great to be able to match that and yeah. get in front of their face. Yeah, for sure. It's true. I haven't seen a, lot, a whole lot of rise. No. Every time we go... we. Maybe a couple, but never Something like has to be that. going on for it to make it yeah. worth their time, right? Yeah, um, exactly. So you only get certain windows yeah. to actually fish dries. When you do, it's great. Mm-hmm. But yeah. the rest of the day, I'd like to be fishing as well. Exactly, so. yeah. That's a th- especially for us, too, because like, we're not that close to the river, right? So we don't really... We really hit the hatches. We were you and I were in one at the beginning of the season. That was cool. It was like a, one of the Hendrickson hatches. But mm-hmm. but what Gavin and I are doing now, we're just flipping over rocks and just seeing matching the nymphs. Yeah. The rocks. That's it. Yeah, it's a great way to approach it. 
That's Joe, yeah. yeah, Joe's advice. That's right. Yeah. Episode four. Yeah. Flipping the rocks. Flipping the rocks. That's a classic. Classic technique. Yeah. yeah. All right, right on. So, what kind of flies are you tying lately? Then this this summer. Yep. What has been kind of uh, this summer? D- what flies have you been designing? Myself? For yourself, not not for customers. Myself. A lot of my design does go into uh, salmon flies. Um, I am working on a bunch of kind of hopper patterns and stuff. I'm headed out west next week, so doing a lot of uh, terrestrials, things like that, big dry right. flies. Yeah, so yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're going on a trip to. I'm doing. Uh, we're going to Calgary on Thursday. Sweet. Right. And uh, I'll fish the bow for a couple of days, and we're going to be hanging down into Fernie. Got to fish the old man, the elk, maybe the wigwam, a couple others. Should be a, a great time. Yeah, yeah. I heard really good things about Fernie. It's fantastic. I haven't fished Fernie, but uh, I've done the bow and Montana and coastal mounds and all that, and it's something else out that way. Yeah. 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 Make it out there if you can, for sure. Yeah. yeah. We want to do a trip down to um, Pennsylvania. That's good as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Some next summer. Um, right, Yelma? Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to? Of course. Let's go. We'll go next summer. <laughs> yeah. Why are you laughing? Are you laughing? Are you sc- he was laughing. He doesn't want to go fish down in Pennsylvania. No, he's, he's scared to ask permissions. <laughs> I'm scared of Trump. Yeah, that's all I hear. Uh, yeah. yeah. Point. Don't worry. Go down this fall. We'll or up just st- in time. Upstate New York, too. I haven't fished in a while, but that's like one of my favorite places to fish. Oh, yeah. I haven't that's fished the long. States yet, so I'm pretty pumped. Oh, yeah. Man. Yeah. But you know what, though? If you're going out west, what do the flies change for you? Um, just based on kind of a local diet of trout. Right. But in terms of the design, everything's fairly similar. Okay. So what we're going out to fish mainly is big streamers for bull trout uh-huh. and um, massive like, hopper patterns for cutthroats, basically. Wow, that's crazy. So the hoppers aren't complex at all. You want something really buoyant. So we're tying with a lot of foam and deer hair mm-hmm. um, and just big and buggy. There isn't a lot of thought that goes into them, to be honest, except for make sure that they land straight and float high. That's yeah. about all we're looking at. And do the colors change? Uh, yeah, we'll carry a bunch of colors and just kind of mix it up out there, but tans, yeah. greens, browns, that's yeah. about it. Yeah. Uh, for the streamers, that's where more thought goes into them. Hmm. Um, so we're dealing with kind of articulated trout streamers. And so these are designed to push water and just basically get the attention of these big fish. Mm-hmm. right? And so when I'm looking at a streamer and designing those, um, great guy to look at is a guy like uh, Kelly Gallup. Mm-hmm. He's uh, a Montana. Anyone who fishes streamers knows the guy. He is amazing at this stuff. Uh, he goes through design as well. But basically, if I'm going to tie an articulated streamer, take something like um, like Sex Dungeon, which is one of his patterns. Mm-hmm. It's one of the most productive flies out there. What does that What does that one look like? So I'll describe it. Basically, on the back end, it's a woolly bugger. It's an oversized like size four woolly bugger. All right, it's not much that goes into it. Um, but basically, it's going to be really mobile. Mm-hmm. It's going to be really skinny um, and easy to move. Mm-hmm. And you'll have a connection. And in the front, you'll have basically another half woolly bugger, uh, big uh, lead eyes, and a uh, big deer head. So how it all works together yeah. is um, this is going to be the same with any articulated streamer if you're mm-hmm. tying it, uh, is the front, you want it to push water. You want it to make noise. You want it to um, resist going through the water as well. And the back hook, you want it to be usually thinner, sparser, and easier to move. And so the idea is that when you're going to really rip this streamer, that back hook uh, wants to keep traveling. There's nothing resisting it. The front, you want to stop dead ants' tracks when you stop stripping. And so that back hook runs into the front one because they're tethered, okay. and it kind of jackknives off to the side. Yeah. So that's one huge thing. It looks like a, a dying fish. gives it a ton of motion, yeah. mm-hmm. a ton of vibration through the water that the fish can pick up on. Mm-hmm. Um, the big deer head is going to push water. It's going to make noise in the water for those fish, again, to feel mm-hmm. on their lateral line and come up and attack it, hopefully. Yeah. Um, and those are the two biggest things that you're looking at for most streamers. You want to push water. You want to have a lot of motion. Yeah. And you want to be castable at the same time. These things are usually about five inches long. Yeah. So they're a good meal mm-hmm. uh, for fish. But you want times so that they can shed water as well. So that's mm-hmm. why we incorporate things like synthetics and flies. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we can actually fish them practically. So the guy that made this pattern, what's his name again? Kelly Gallup. Okay, he's down in Montana, you said? Yeah, yeah. He okay. fishes the Madison and owns a slide-in down there. Yeah. Really famous streamer guide. Yeah. Uh, and, and other stuff as well. Before. Yeah. 
but he runs a wicked operation. Mm-hmm. Um, that's his specialty, is streamer fishing. That's what he's known, rolled over for. He designed some awesome stuff. But if you look at the patterns that he ties, uh, a great example, he's all over the place, and there's always a reason for it. You don't just lash stuff to a hook and hope that works, right? Mm-hmm. You gotta think, you know, if I'm tying, say, a bass fly, you know, I wanna tie a little streamer for it. Well, it's not just color and size, it's going to be something like, okay, what depth do I want to fish, right? If I want to fish a couple of feet down, maybe I get some deer hair in there and fish it with a pair of sinking eyes or a sinking line, um, and I'll keep it at that level. If I want to get really far down, I'll tie it sparser, I'll tie it heavier, and I'll just drop right down. If I want to tie on top, I'm going to basically get to displace as much water as possible. So I'm going to make a big profile. I'm going to use light materials that aren't going to wick up water. Um, and I'll keep it on top. Mm-hmm. So it's just little things like that. You can always go through and back your head and you know, just think before you attach any material to a hook, what's it going to do? How's it going to affect my fly in the end? Right. Yep. And why will it benefit the process of catching the fish? Exactly. Is the reason I'm doing it or am I doing it because... Just for fun. Just for fun or, or whatever, right? Whatever, yeah. It's, yeah. That's going to be the only reason. thought is how will it help me catch fish? Right. That's what right. it comes down to. That's the number one principle, I guess, in, in the design of the fly. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yep. Very cool. I feel like the the expressions on social media with people sharing their flies is always like, oh, that will fish. But if you spend 30 minutes on your vice putting your shit together on a hook, yep. you don't know if that will fish. Not really. necessarily. Like, you what should, would you, you say to, to these, What, what advice idea. would you say to these people? <laughs> I would say swim your flies before you fish them. Now, a lot of time, you know, these flies are fishy flies that guys can look at and say, okay, that will fish. Mm. Um, with that cash. That catched. That's the other thing. <laughs> Usually, you should be able to tell roughly if okay. it'll work or not off the bat. Uh, it may not for whatever reason, but you should have an idea if it will actually fish. Uh, my biggest pet peeve is really heavily dressed streamers. Mm. So you see guys tying like steelhead flies, for example, yeah. um, like an intruder or a hobo or a classic spay fly, and they put way too much material on because they want to build. They want to bulk it up. Yeah. If you look at an intruder, how they're tied is. Um, basically you have a little dubbing ball or something like that at the mm-hmm. back with some hackle or a dubbing loop with fox, whatever. Um, and then some long ostrich, rhea, amherst, whatever fibers over top. Yeah. Really thin body with the same thing duplicated in the front. And so you get this fly that has almost no material in it. They're pretty time-consuming flies, but they have yeah. next to no material. And yet they have this massive profile that yeah. really shows up well in the water. Mm-hmm. So they're super easy to cast. Because they're sparse, they get down. Right? Yeah. They aren't going to displace water. They aren't going to wick up water. Mm-hmm. They're going to sink like a rock. Mm-hmm. And so you can fish really accurately where you want to be. Most guys, when I see them tying spay flies, they will tie two or three hackles in. They'll yeah. really bulk it up, try and make that profile. A tie on five different hairs for the wing. and They'll look okay sometimes dry but as soon as you get them in the water they're Beautiful stiff life. they yeah. don't do anything yeah. they just kind of sit there yeah, you know yeah. Yeah. um on, and sometimes science. that's enough you know and then they roll too because there's no clear right. uh, keel weight to them but right. sparser fly just the bend and the point in your hook mm-hmm. should be enough weight that it will keel weight them and yeah, get them to up. ride straight sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. um or ride top down if that's what you're trying to achieve yeah um mm-hmm. But there should be definitely a uh, preferred orientation to the fly. And you should be able to get that just with the way of the hook. You shouldn't have to play around with it too much. If you cram too many materials on, it doesn't work. It's almost like guys are uh, designing these flies to look good out of the water. Yep. And yeah. they, don't, they don't test it in a sink or something before exactly. and see how, it, how the action is. Right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. I fall into that category, I think, yeah. sometimes. I, <laughs> I tie flies, I'm like, shit, this looks good outside of the water. Yeah. And then I never fish it. And yeah. then you put or it in your bath, and you're like, that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly what you said, right? It's yeah. just, like, too bulky. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, you got to take things in stride. Sometimes you want a bulky fly, again, to push water to get, you know, make itself known. But there has to be a reason that's going to be bulky. You're not just making it bulky for the sake of it. Right? So could that be a good lesson, then? Maybe less is more? Less is definitely more in most aspects of fly tying. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And that's interesting, like, too, because I found the same thing. I've used too much thread. Mm-hmm. Yep. I've used it when I started, you know, and then as soon as I was like, just use half. Don't think about it. Just use half. No. Yep. To secure any material when you're fly tying, three turns of thread. That's all you need. Three turns? 
returns a thread. And that's secured. You'll bulk up more wraps over time as you tie the fly, right? Because mm-hmm. if I tie in, say, a clump of bucktail in the back of a fly for a tail or whatever, and I use three wraps, right? Then maybe I want to tie a bit of flash over it. I'll tie another three wraps. Suddenly that bucktail is held by six wraps, right? Yeah. So you're bulking up over time. It's getting a better grip. Mm-hmm. Now, the one exception is on more slippery materials where you want to build up a body. Right. Then maybe you want to go over it and smooth things out or really lash down. Bucktail actually would be one example where maybe you want to go into the butts you know, with a few more wraps and really get them secured down because it's pretty slick stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, just minimize everything whenever possible. Yeah. Minimize head cement. I see a lot of guys make big, bulky heads that don't yeah. work well. Stuff wicks in materials, makes the fly stiff again. Yeah. So just a you know, minimal amount of that, uh, minimal amount of thread wraps. Keep everything fairly sparse, as sparse as possible, because it's going to help you when you're fishing as well. Yeah. When you're casting, a sparse fly going through the air will travel more right. easily, right? Yeah, no, totally. Makes sense. Would you say like tread size is very important as well? Because I found yeah. like I found like when I was a kid, you know, I would try, I would like tie like Mickey fins and all these classic bucktails, and my heads would be super huge. And then when I look at my tread, it was like number six, like five, and then yep. I switch up just two down, like uh, to a number eight, and then it changed everything. Like the yeah. heads were oh, a lot absolutely. more sleek. And yeah, you definitely want to try and use the thinnest thread size. possible. And that's why. We're tying um, with more finicky materials like deer hair and things where we really want to crank down up. It's still a guess small head. Things like gel spun really come into play. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, super thin threads that are stronger than anything else you can get. They're pricey, but in certain applications they work. Um, always use the smallest thread that you can yeah. practically for that uh, fly. But at the same time, if you have really good thread control, you should be able to tie 16, tie 16 with 6 aught, 3 aught thread and get away with it if you have really good thread control, but that's tough. Okay. So definitely, you know, downsize when possible. Mm-hmm. Practice makes perfect. Yep. Yeah, repetition, eh? That's yeah. it. So thread control is a pretty important element of it, eh? It's massive. Yeah. Massive. So what's, what, what's, what is thread control? Thread control is a couple of things. So it's being able to place wrap where you want it, and it's adjusting the tension on your thread, mm. um, and getting materials to lie the way that you want them underneath the thread, I would say, as well. So... One huge thing, uh, when you may only see it when guys are starting, um, is keeping tension. So you'll see guys, they'll take loose wraps, or they'll have tension and just let it go, and your fly explodes. Yeah. Right? So that's one major thing that's pretty easy to get a grasp on after the first few times going, mm-hmm. but it's just keeping tension on your thread, mm-hmm. um, controlling the tension of your thread. So if I want to actually tie in a material, say in a specific spot on the fly, um, I'll use what's called a pinch wrap, mm-hmm. usually. And so what you do is you put your fingers around the fly, you kind of straddle them with your fly, mm. or with your fingers. Um, you hold the material exactly where you want it. You come up between your fingers with your thread, mm-hmm. right? You actually pinch your thread in place, mm-hmm. and you come down with a loose wrap mm-hmm. and uh, come up and tighten down. And so okay. I'll just lash it straight down. Yeah. Uh, keep it in place there for you. And, and that makes the material lie the way that you intend. Exactly. Okay. Exactly where you want it. Very just cool. little things like that. Awesome. Yeah. All right, well, we're going to just take a quick break, and then we'll be right back to probably jump in a little bit more about um, your fishing, because I've seen pictures. We've all seen pictures of the fish you're catching. <laughs> Blowing my mind. I want to talk a bit about that. <laughs> all, right. all right. So, so Chris, mm. um, so, you know, I'm new to trout fishing. Yep. Now, and I love, I love how, um, I love to see my, the fish rise, or like when they hit the, the dries. Now, yeah. if you're tying a dry, you know, any advice on, you know, first, your first kind of intro to uh, a dry fly? Sure. So, what I would look at first is the kind of water that you're going to be fishing, all right? So, if you're going to be fishing really fast, pockety, riffly water, you're going to want something really buoyant, all right? So, that's when you know, wolf-style flies come into play, foam as well. Uh, things that are basically unsinkable, right? They displace a lot of water and they're going to float high. You don't need to worry too much about the actual profile, or the profile is important, but not so much about the um, realistic aspects of the fly. It doesn't have to be spot on. It really has to just uh, grab their attention and get them looking up. Um, so you don't need to worry about too much. Where uh, the more realistic side of things come into play is fishing slower waters, fishing pools, back eddies, and where the fish has time to look at a fly. Uh, some slower riffles as well, for sure. Yeah. Um, so then you can go sparser on your fly. So that's the first thing I go and look at is mm-hmm. am I going to fish fast or slow? 
Um, a lot of time if you're matching the hatch, it's going to be mainly slower water, I would say, where flies are going to pool up, especially for spinners, because they're going to kind of pool up in those back eddies. Yeah. Um, if you're fishing more aggressive flies, things that are um, coming down that fast water, don't sweat too much, just come up with a basic profile and something really buoyant. Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking at that slower water, what you want to do is, um, that's when really a match a hatch um, side things come into play. So look at those insects closely and don't just look at what they look like to us. Try and figure out what they look like on the underside to trout, right? What kind of impression they leave on the water is the biggest thing. So flies that don't necessarily look too realistic, um, a lot of time catch the most fish. Flies like, say, usual, right? Usual is a great sort of merger or cripple pattern. And if you look at us, it's you know this big bushy fly. It doesn't look like anything. It's a bunch of snowshoe hair tied on a hook, right? Yeah. Um, but in the water, what it does is it gets this really nice translucency that looks very close to mayfly wings. Right. Mm -hmm. It sits very low in the water, like a cripple does. They don't stand on top of the water, um, and it just looks very very buggy, right? Um, even though it looks like nothing to us. Uh, but to the trout, they're looking up, oh, that's a fly. Yeah. It can be nothing else. Mm -hmm. If you take a really realistic fly, some of these crazy you know, kind of European style of realistics, yeah. a lot of times they'll have hard foam bodies, uh, big you know, plastic wings, things like that, and they look great to us. When they're on the water, they sit really hard, they don't have soft edges, they uh, don't have translucency to the bodies, they don't have the right colors sometimes to the fish when they're actually looking through the water. Um, and so they're sometimes maybe great, you know, I've never really been into them, but um, a lot of time they will be outfished by more natural uh, yeah. kind of material based patterns. Um, would you stick to synthetics versus I would natural? stick to mostly naturals when it comes to imitating natural right. things. Uh, synthetics are great if you want a uh, fly that's going to shed water. That's where they really come into play because synthetics don't absorb for the most part. Exactly, and that's why I'm asking because I feel like a lot of the times when I'm uh, fishing dries, they mm -hmm. get wet and they start to sink, yeah. right? Yeah, that's going to come down to your floatant. Uh, Loon makes a really great product called uh, Hydrostop. It's basically just a jar of floatant. You sink okay. your flies in that for a few minutes, you dry them off, and they're permanently waterproof, actually. Wow. So that, that can be a fix for some okay. of those less buoyant patterns. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, synthetics do have a place there, for mm -hmm. sure. They're easier to dry off. They can mm -hmm. still sink, though. Right? It's true. just that as you're casting, they're going to dry off for you. Um, I'd say stick with mostly naturals. Um, synthetic dubbing would be one exception for dry. Synthetic dubbing is great because it doesn't wake up the same amount. What's synthetic dubbing? So something like super dry dubbing, yeah. um, where it's all synthetic materials. It's not rabbit fur. It's not seal or anything like that. It is just synthetic. It doesn't absorb water. It takes floating really easily. Um, it dubs very nicely for small bodies. Uh, dubbing is one place where synthetics are fantastic. Um, and sometimes, in other places too, if you take fly like um, the, um, sparkle pupas, things like that, where you just want to have a little shuck trailing, yeah. then things like antron yarn give a really nice kind of glistening sparkle yeah. to a fly. It looks just like a mayfly shuck. Nice. Um, but apart from that, uh, naturals generally have um, a better ability to let light penetrate. Um, they sit more naturally on the water. They're softer materials. They have a nicer taper to them usually. Uh, so they are usually the best bet for a dry fly because yeah. you're looking at just getting a really nice natural impression on the water for the most part. Yeah. I feel like another rule of thumb for fly tying is common sense, really, because you didn't yeah. mention, like, how is it going to look to the trout? Yeah, duh, right? Yeah, it's not how it looks to you. I say a guy up on my break there. Um, if you have a fly and it's dry, it's not necessarily going to look like in the water, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, you know, dry flies are a bit of an exception here because they do sit out of the water, yeah. but it's still not going to be exactly how it looks in the water. If you run it under a tap and then look at it afterwards when it's wet, a lot of guys do that. It's completely flawed because that's not at all how a fly looks when it's in the water. It's how it looks after you fished it. Yeah. Uh, what you have to do is look at in the water or under the water to really get an idea of the translucency of materials, how they behave in different kinds of currents, um, what it takes to move them, more for streamers than dries, but yeah. uh, definitely the imprint and the light penetration are big things for them. Cool. Oh. Yeah. That's just my question. Yeah. So, yeah, just kind of look at the bug you're fishing and 
you know, take a really close look at its defining characteristics. Uh, things like Hendrickson have that little bit pink in them. Um, with you know, drakes, so you're looking at just big profile. That's the big thing because you're fishing in low light a lot of time. They just need to leave a really solid imprint. Now, with a caddis, a lot of time you want to skate them, so you need something that's going to be able to skate without sinking. Uh, you might want um, an egg sack on the back of your drives if you're fishing uh, spinners dropping. You know, yeah. Just little things like that. So we're going out right now. Yep. Okay? Right after this podcast. Yep. Where should we go? I would say go to the Grand Roar down uh, and around either um, Bean Park, down Brantford, or in Paris, I should say, or down uh, oh, yeah, toward Paris. Five Oaks. I about Paris. Yeah, anything like that, down to where Caledonia. Cool. Scout out the water if you're steelhead fishermen. Take a look, see what's going to be there for you when steelhead rolls around. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just do some bass fishing. Yeah, there's probably some good bass there, eh? Yeah, if you have a boat or access to anything like that, go out for pike, muskie, bass in the lakes. Yeah. Nice, so let's um, cut this podcast but... short. Let's go. All right. <laughs> All right, see you guys. <laughs> yeah. So the good one, I was so glad to have we're going to go fishing next. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's getting hot for trout. I Fair. mean, we're on the verge of having a drought in... And Ontario um, rivers are uh, low. Yep, so. on Whiteman's Creek, they've officially asked everyone to stop fishing it. Oh, wow. uh, because and that's the same for any trout stream around here right now. They're all kind of tipping that 70 degree mark or over. Mm-hmm. And so if you hook a trout, it doesn't even matter if you're catching it or being abusive to it outside the water. If you just hook it and land it very quickly, mm-hmm. it'll probably kill that fish. Because really? it's, it's even if you exhausting. keep it in the water? Yep, because you're exhausting it. And uh, basically, it in, can recover, uh, yeah. exactly in that higher temperature water, it doesn't hold as much oxygen for them. Mm-hmm. And uh, trout are very finicky in what they can withstand. And so, even if they swim away on you a couple hours later, is a good chance to let your belly up. Yeah. Oh, really? so okay. Definitely avoid trout until September, you know, or even later this month when we get those cooler nights. Um, and you can fish in the mornings in September, more throughout the day. It'll be similar to early season. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's good advice for everybody that's listening in too. Yep. Leave leave the trout alone. Exactly. If you're in they're southern still, Ontario, leave them alone. They're still open. You know, you're allowed lawfully to fish for them, but ethically avoid them. Yeah. yeah. It's not about rules sometimes. Yep. It's about being a good, exactly. a good person. Good. <laughs> you're almost showing me fish pictures of myself. Yeah. <laughs> what is it? What'd you pull up? I am Look uh, what you caught. Yeah, Laker Look from the Niagara. Lake. Oh man. I was nice I was just at Niagara Falls yesterday for. Yeah, for a photo job and uh, I was looking at the river and I was like man yeah, we I'm need fishing. to hit that it I haven't I have never fishing. fished it yet yeah so, so yeah you've been doing it for a while yeah, yeah. It's, it for a while. it's a well if you want to fish the gorge at least it is a grueling hike down and up um, but once you're down there it is gorgeous you get lots of water yourself usually the whirlpool is an exception it's busy I usually avoid it but um, if you head down towards it's the probably more Glen and all that or even on the state side there's lots of water you can get to yourself yeah it's oh, yeah? fantastic. It is dangerous down there. Take uh, take caution. But it's fantastic. I watch, love it. watch out for your ankles. Anything. Yeah. Don't wade it. If you're going to wade, don't wade past you know, low on your shins. Avoid wading whenever possible. Yeah. Um, even if you're a good wader, it's fast. that's not something to mess with. They have shelves down there as well. So you go out 10 feet and it's fairly shallow, maybe, and then and it, it just go. drops off into nothing. Nice. Like you have no clue where bottom is. And there's a lot of currents. Yeah. Like a lot. A lot of different <laughs> currents. Yeah. yeah. It's fun fishery. Yeah, it must be. Absolutely. You fish deep, I guess, eh? Not go as for deep sink, as you sink line? Think. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Sink lines. And we fish uh, switch rods down there. You can fish, if you have like a seven, eight weight single hand rod, you can fish big sinking lines down there with that as well. Yeah. But it's definitely suited towards short spay rods, things like that. Because you don't have a lot of back cast room. It's pretty yeah. crowded down there. It's fun. Yeah. All those fish kind of stack up along the banks, too. So you're fishing pretty close to you. Just yeah. down. And we're down to 10 feet. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, fun. if you could leave everybody with the show with one piece of fly design advice, just one thing to leave everybody. One okay. thing that is crucially important, and I know it's kind of a bad question because there's not necessarily one thing, mm. but... So many factors. So many factors in, in designing a nice fly, right? Yeah. But what's the, for someone maybe that's new to fly tying or new to mm. getting into fly design... Yeah, like me. Like, pretend I'm asking this question. Yeah. What, what would you say? I would say, um, really, like Gabe said, just have common sense and try and. Or as Yilmaz said that. Sorry. <laughs> I have no common sense. Okay. I yeah, would never I say something like this. It. I just thought you had an epiphany there. <laughs> um, <laughs> just try and look at your fly and think of how is the water going to play with this? Like it looks great to me now. Once I get in there, though, you got to kind of work out in your head what's what it's going to do. And uh, if you're working with a new material, especially, 
try and, when you tie a fly with it, take it to the water, and before you ever fish it, just kind of hang at your feet and look and see what it does. And you have a better understanding for future reference how it's going to work for you, if you're going to use it as a prop material, if you're going to use it as a wing, if you're um, using it as a body material, whatever. But you'll have an idea of how it looks or how it behaves in the water, um, and you can kind of extend that to the other time. Just try and get a good understanding of what your materials are and uh, what they're going to do for you. Cool. That's about it. They're all tools. Yeah. Well, Chris, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, it's a good time. Thanks, thanks Chris. It's been a while. We wanted to have you on, so finally it happens. Yeah. It'll yeah. happen again. We'll bug, you, we'll bug you again. Yeah. Thanks for I'm having us into uh, <laughs> Drift today as well. Um, for everybody thanks to listening. Rob. Yeah, Rob's in the shop now, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, Rob. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for letting us uh, use uh, your shop. Yeah. Sound quality is amazing. Yeah. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for selling your products to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and for everybody listening, uh, you know, Steelhead season's right around the corner, yeah, so I come on in as well. Yep. If uh, anyone wants to kind of test their flies out, we have a fly tank tester here. Oh yeah, um, they are for sales. Well, if anyone needs one, but we have one running in the shop. And uh, if anyone just wants to come down, dunk their flies in, see what's uh, what they're going to do, yeah. feel free. Yeah, you know, for sure. Time. Uh, we also have a spay clave coming up, uh, not hosted by us, hosted by Friends of the Grand, but it's a yeah. great event if anyone wants to tune up on their spay casting. Um, they're just kind of get, uh, get warmed up, get the juices flowing for the season. When's that coming up? That's going to be on September 17th and 18th at uh, Brant Conservation Area down Brantford. Okay. Oh, Brand. Same place. Yep, same yeah. place it's been the last few years. So right, if anyone right. wants to get down there, all the vendors will be there. We'll have a booth as well, kind of show off new gear. Uh, if anyone wants to play around with it, it's all there. Cool. So last year you guys weren't really selling; it was more display. It'll be the same this year. We're same not selling same. down there. We'll just kind of have a, an overview of the shop. And, yeah. Yeah. You know, let people know what's going on. Try some stuff out. Yeah. Yes. And you guys also have a, a trip that looks like uh, going down to Belize. Wow. Oh, Next year. Yeah. What the sh- what the shit? <laughs> you know, uh, it's That's it, right? <laughs> I'm so excited. It's absolutely spectacular. Uh, fishing for bonefish, uh, fishing for permits, uh, tarpon. Yeah. Uh, snook, whatever's in the water, so it's going to be a hell of a time. Hell yeah. yeah Everybody check that out and uh, make sure you come by. And then yep. All the details for that, uh, you can get them in the shop or they're on our Facebook page as well. Um, and I'll be happy to give you a hand. If yeah, you guys need a journalist to cover the trip, <laughs> let me know. Yeah. You know. Beauty. Well, thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, it's been really good. And uh, from us, don't forget to check out social on Instagram. We're the SoFly Crew, and on Facebook, we're SoFly. And if you have any questions about the show or about anything you want to ask us, we'll uh, we'll answer them on the segment. So just send us an email to uh, the SoFly Crew at gmail dot com, and we will get to that. But for this one, that's it for me. I'm out. I'm out as well. I'm going fishing. All right, me too. See you guys later.